<clears throat> yeah, welcome everyone to the HODLcast. Today we have special guest Crypto Graffiti. Um, Crypto Graffiti, thank you so much for taking the time out today to come on here. Maybe you can introduce yourself and give a little background of how you got involved in the Bitcoin space. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, hi everyone. Um, <laughs> so I'm an artist. I do work that relates to, to crypto and, and Bitcoin and this whole whole movement. Um, and I initially was, was turned on to Bitcoin back in 2011 when I was working on a startup here in San Francisco and the developer that I had hired just wanted to be paid in Bitcoin. And he said it kind of offhandedly, I think it was more him like testing the waters to see if I had even heard of it type of thing. I don't think it was too serious. Mm -hmm. Um, but I didn't know anything about what it was. Um, and so that was the first reference to it. And, one of the things about living in, in San Francisco is that you just tend to hear about stuff early. It's kind of a privilege. Like, like I remember when Yelp was just like an email that like friends would pass around to give uh, recommendations and like Uber, like when it was Uber cab and people were starting to use it for the first time, like Airbnb would, like started literally on my street. And so it's, if you, if you deal with a, the downsides of living in, in San Francisco, which are have kind of been exacerbated as of late, um, there's there's a lot of upside too, and so this was one of them. Being able to hear about uh, Bitcoin uh, pretty early on, and and from there, I um, I just kind of would hear it in passing in cafes and stuff, and then I investigated it a little bit more, and I I liked what I was reading, and and it was kind of pie in the sky at first. A lot of people talk about this like a rabbit hole moment, but for me it was it was several moments um, because really it, you, you, you want something that sort of like hits close to home. And at the beginning, like for me it was, all right, I've, I get this idea of, of not needing banks and, and these middle, uh, middle persons, but it was like I had frustrations with banks. And so that was like, okay, that's good. I get that. Um, but you know what else type of thing and um for me the the one that was really like wow and i i can remember where i was exactly because i ended up staying up like all night researching it was hearing adam back's theories about how uh, micropayments would help with um ddos attacks by charging like a negligible amount to try and log into uh like a website as an example, you know, that would thwart these, these attacks. Um, and that for me was like, huh, there's, there's all these other things that you can do with this too. Um, so applying different use cases for microtransactions. Uh, I, I DJ um, on the side just for fun and thinking how it could be applied there possibly. And I come from a family of artists and, and thinking of, of ways where it might make sense there too. That's what really started to get the wheels turning, and that's um, where I sort of like dove in and and decided to to really uh, to commit to the space and doing more with it. But that in and of itself was sort of gradual over time too. Oh, very cool. And were you like what were you focused on before Bitcoin? Um, like what where were you stationed in life? Like what were you still doing art before? Obviously you were, but um, what kind of art were you doing or? Yeah, you know, I really was, I would always do it on the side um, and people would say, you know, you should do something with, with your art. But I, um, you know, straight out of college, I just went, I went right into sales. Um, I was kind of like a, like a bad kid growing up and it was my way of like proving that, okay, now that I got my college degree, I can go and like, here's these numbers and there I did it. Um, so <laughs> that, that was a, like my way of showing that, oh, I've made it in some fashion. And so I worked for um, a couple of startups doing sales. Uh, and then I also worked at Apple. Um, and then I did my own startup, kind of like everyone else in San Francisco. And so that, that was where I met this developer who told me about Bitcoin. Oh, very cool. I, I was a little bad growing up too and also went into sales <laughs> before. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what type of sales did you do? Uh, well, I started off actually like as a trader for, for TD Ameritrade and then I switched over to working in the branch. So it was selling mortgages and then 
eventually at mutual fund companies selling the mutual funds to the investment advisors. But it was, gotcha. uh, it was a grind for that because you never know how the mutual funds are going to perform, but you always have to sell them on, oh, they should do well because the economy is doing this or that. Or it was. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, you got that, that quarterly number to hit. And yeah. Mm -hmm. That was something for me with like the sales stuff is it's, it's, uh, I did. I didn't want to do it unless I like believed in in the product, you know. Because otherwise, it's just like, oh, he, yeah, you he, can't do it, and the people can tell if you if you don't believe what you're saying. Or mm -hmm. yeah, so um, it's a grind. Well, no matter how well you do, it's always like the you know the boss is looking like, what have you done for me lately? Like uh, last quarter sales don't matter. Or I just I got so sick of it. Yeah, same. I kind of saw the uh the long-term outlook of it too when i was at apple they they would send people who were doing well uh to austin where they had this like advanced sales training type thing and i just saw these like 20-year vets who their like war stories were like oh i was down on my number this one month and i knew that if i called this this customer that that he didn't do me right and then, and then they'd they'd order something ahead of time and it was like oh i don't want that to be like yeah. What I, I consider like a proud moment. Um, I don't know. It wasn't, wasn't for me. I think uh, I think it is obviously important. People need to move product and and explain why it's beneficial. But um, I got a, I got a good taste of it and learned a lot. I think it's really beneficial. Ultimately, if you're doing entrepreneurial thing, you're selling your own product, and um, yeah, it's a good experience. Yeah. Well, thank God for Bitcoin. Uh, the, the, I guess led us both to where we are. You know, di more diversified careers or maybe more fulfilling. I don't know. <laughs> I say for you for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, but so so I wanted to ask you. I saw an article came out yesterday by CoinDesk, and it had your Maduro piece right on the um, you know cover of it, and it looked like. Uh, they're doing some funny stuff in Venezuela with the airports and the taxis or sorry, the taxes that they're charging through the planes. Have you, did you learn, do you know much about that or can you comment on it? Um, I only saw it when you'd mentioned it in brief earlier. Uh, what I do think is kind of interesting is that this is where Maduro is turning, you know, he's, uh, this isn't like their first brush with Bitcoin too. In, in, in doing that project, I learned about just how extensive uh, their um, taking over of, of mining equipment is and they would target people and under threat of prison time, um, take, take all their equipment. And so they're like mining, like Bitcoin. Uh, but just in terms of the, the, the progression, you know, they, they tried to do their own Shitcoin, the, the Petro, and it didn't take off. It was, I don't know why anyone would have any, any trust in it. Um, but now they're, they're coming back to Bitcoin. It sort of highlights uh, some of the, the downsides, I think, to a truly open money. You know, um, it can uh, get in the hands of people who, who are going to use it any which way that they want. Mm -hmm. And can you explain it? Like you did that amazing piece there and then you went to the, the, it was it the river right across from Venezuela and the Venezuelans helped you take down the um, the dollar or the what are they called the bull bars each time someone bought a, sh a piece of your art can you kind of give give people an overview if they aren't familiar with it sure yeah um, well I just in general it sort of was spawned out of this like feeling of, of guilt and finding myself frequently referencing how Venezuela is like the the great use case for why this technology is important, but not knowing a lot about the situation down there. Um, and I wanted to learn more and, and get involved. And so for me, it's a lot uh, easier to just get hands on, you know, with, with my work and just with learning in general, I'm very visual and, and want to be uh, immersed. So uh, I talked with a lot of people who were doing work in the area and um, I, planned this event in, in conjunction with RTM and Crypto Conserje, a couple of uh, uh, companies that are doing work uh, in the region. RTM is the largest exchange in Latin America. Uh, Crypto Conserje is, is in Cucuta and they're onboarding merchants to Bitcoin. 
Um, and so we planned this all day event where we would teach um, refugees about uh, Bitcoin and, and how it worked. And so rather than just kind of like telling them, um, we did a full like, life cycle of how a transaction worked. And so uh, we distributed uh, Bitcoin and showed them, you know, um, how to do a transaction. And there were vendors there who accepted Bitcoin. And so they can, can buy essential food kits uh, that were on site if, if they wanted to. Um, and so all this was uh, funded by this, this mural. And it was a thousand different boulevards and it depicted Maduro. And it was this weird concept uh, where people online could click and then um, designate a specific boulevard to be removed in person from uh, people whose lives have been affected by Maduro. And so this, the, the idea was uh, that uh, together we, we could bring him down, juntos lo tumbamos. And um, for a lot of my work, it's, it's trying to have this uh, collaborative aspect to it and to get people involved and to participate. And um, so, yeah, that was, that was a way to try to do that, to have people from all over the world be able to, to, to take part in this, in this work um, and to try and just teach about this movement in person at, at the event. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's awesome. And how, how, did the, how did the locals respond to it? Like, what was the reaction? Uh, so it, I wasn't ready for it. Um, the entire project was sort of fast tracked because it was at a time when uh, everything was really kind of hitting the fan in Venezuela and, and the borders were being shut down and there was just um, a lot of chaos going on. And so in the lead up to it, there was just a ton of planning, not just in having this event and like wider reaching um, like day long aspect of it, but just making the art and, and then shipping the art and everything that comes with that. And so I was so focused on, on those types of things that when we did the event itself, I just wasn't like mentally prepared for seeing these people and um, the venue where we held the, the day event, it was, we could only let so many people in at a time. And so to see, these people who just really had nothing trying to like fight their way to get in and um Not you know how many people could come in like was it a big crowd or yeah yeah there was i think 300 people um wow. when it was all said and done um but it was done in like stages mm -hmm. and yeah just seeing them like fighting to want to get in to to get these these things for sustenance was just pretty heavy and then like mothers like holding up their babies to, to try and um, influence the, the people that were letting them in. Um, pretty heavy stuff. And then, uh, so because there was this online aspect of it too, I, I regrettably like had my, my face in, in my phone for, for more than I wanted to because like, okay, well they, this person uh, bought this boulevard to be taken down and, and so, um, yeah, there were just times when I would, I would get back into the reality of the situation and, and try and talk to people in my broken Spanish and, and just get a sense of what was going on. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a moving experience. There was one lady in particular who just wanted to rip the entire thing down. Um, and she just was adamant about, you can just see it in her eyes, how, how much this person had, had affected her life and her, her family's lives. And so she was just tearing the boulevards off and, you know, it, it didn't really sync up with the idea for what we were doing, but we just kind of, kind of threw our hands in the air. It's like, let her, let her go. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a big, uh, big tough, um, ordeal that I'm, I'm happy that we put together and I'd like to continue to do some work in the region and continue just learning in general about what's going on and, uh, a lot of areas that are under authoritarian rule because uh, I think it's for me the most interesting aspect of this movement um, and were, were a lot had any of them used Bitcoin already because I know sometimes they publish the local Bitcoin stats of what countries are doing the most transactions and Venezuela has seen pretty big uh, 
big volume from there. Um, so what was your sense of like how many people were using Bitcoin and are they allowed? Because I thought, you know, under that authority, they wouldn't want to allow people into some other kind of currency. So do they have to do it in secret? Yeah, so that was a concern just in general with, with holding the event and as we look towards like future events or planning. Um, there, it, it's just like chaotic, you know, the, the Sabine down there, the, the intelligence agency can pick people up for any reason, you know, and it's uh, uh, people disappear, there's death squads, it's uh, not, a, not a good situation. Um, most of them, or there was very few who had used it, let alone known about it. Um, so that was one huge takeaway was that there's just such a long way to go. Um, and you hear about the successes, but they're pretty few and far between. Mm -hmm. So that was something that was maybe one of the, the positives. Um, so then I wonder if the transactions we're seeing is the government itself and not the people using it for, you know, I, I was thinking in my mind, maybe they've developed a nice black market situation that's actually helping people get goods and services and, um, you know, interact in commerce. But I wonder if maybe it's all transactions we're seeing are from um, the government using it for these like taxes and airport stuff. Yeah, that's a good question. I know, I know that there is like substance to that, to those numbers. And it's not, you know, just, just the government. I've talked to people since then who've, who've shared their stories about, about using it in the region. Um, the government probably wouldn't use local Bitcoins. They'd be on some other. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> But, mm -hmm. so yeah so all in all it was um it was a, a good experience i'm glad that i did it and i think it just reminded me that this is something that i want to do more and i think i was fortunate to to live like some of my younger years in an area outside of this san francisco bubble that kind of like reminded me that it's not always like this it's like a very odd place to 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 live and so i i like to try and like get outside of it um the 2014 bear market i i went down i lived in, in central america for for a couple of years and, and traveled around a bit and, uh i think it's something that a lot of people should consider you know much like like running a full node you know like try like if if you really are like committing to the, the space in my opinion it makes sense to to try and get in the shoes of, of people where this, this can have a big difference for them, maybe more in, in different ways than, than for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, mm -hmm. I, I had a few clients that were from Venezuela and had met them at the conference in Miami um, in 2017. And they, they were my, they had they were mining from America, but they were saying it was really illegal to mine in Venezuela at that time. And then I had another friend that went there, and he said he was um, fine, or he was actually in Colombia. But he said that there were brownouts happening all the time, and that he suspected it was from people driving around in buses, and they were mining like from a mobile position so that the government wouldn't find them and be able to pinpoint all the power that was being used from like a certain house or something like that so they kept it moving but it was uh it was pretty interesting um to imagine wow. yeah that is interesting it's one of these it, where you're amazed at what the, the lengths that people will go through to survive you know yeah ingenuity. yeah but from from what from this article too about if Venezuela is do like if their government is doing a lot of mining, I wonder what's going to happen in terms of fungibility because all those bitcoins that would be like used in their airport or ta you know in the tax system that they're whatever they're doing with the tax like charging converting taxes and from the airplane fees into bitcoin is what I think I understood from that. Um, that would mean the for the coin analysis or chain analysis um, in America, all those would be tainted. And so, right. and then if they're putting them through Russian exchanges and uh, yeah, it's going to create some fungibility issues that, uh, do you have any thoughts on what, how they'll deal with that or? 
No, it, it makes me curious as to their like sophistication level with regards to the, the tracking and analysis and, and how much can be seen. You know, I, I, I wonder if they're like up to speed in terms of, uh, you know, the, the flagging. Um, I don't know. I think it, for them, it probably doesn't matter as long as there's one exchange, which it sounds like there is that will cash out their Bitcoin. Then from that exchange, I don't. It, it's probably it'll filter through the system, and then it could result in people in America getting that money, and then Coinbase not accepting it or something like that, which they they really shouldn't for OFAC reasons. Now that we've got all these rules on it but even OFAC I don't know the exact everyone talks about it from a really scary um, position but if if a Bitcoin has gone from like you know a dirty place to a clean place how far back I wonder will they force them to go like if it ever touched like I know all the Silk Road coins kind of got cleaned because the government bought them and then from there they're okay but uh, It'll uh, either either the mixing systems are gonna have gonna get better, so it'll be impossible to tell how far back things or you know where where coins were generated from, or they're gonna have to come up with some rules saying like if it's been through five addresses, it's no longer you know it, it's no longer in the same possession, or I don't know. It, it's difficult questions, I guess, for the regulators to have to figure out. Yeah, exactly. It seems like it's something that's only a matter of time before they start to get more and more specific about these things. Yeah. And, um, and then you, you also, you did that black swan piece with the lightning, um, payments. It was like the, what was it? The, the least expensive piece of art ever sold. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so that was you know, one of the things that got me into the space, as I mentioned earlier was, this promise of, of micropayments. Um, and so for me, it's just incredibly interesting to think of, of this. It's almost like, uh, like the, the movie, honey, I shrunk the kids or there's a, this whole other like small world down there, you know, and, yeah. and the poss possibilities that, that lie in this, this tiny area. Um, so like for, from a DJ perspective, it was, it was seeing these underground house DJs that I really liked just not, being able to pocket a lot of the money because they had um, these these online distributors that were taking a, a, a big cut in, in ways that maybe they can get uh, more revenue coming in uh, through crypto um, to uh, just like like what I was doing early on with with, with street art and this idea of, of being able to get paid from people who walked by it uh, and happened to like it. Like I just, I, I think it's, it's, uh, gonna happen where everyone just has like a an address i don't know what if, if it's gonna be like a hologram or what and we're all gonna be in our silver unitards it, but i think there's gonna be this situation where we uh we're gonna be spiffed uh, on the fly for for doing good deeds and um and and it's just gonna be like all these everyday scenarios and um so yeah i just have like all like, all these concepts where um, microtransactions will, will come into play and I wanted to try and highlight uh, an interesting use case in in an art piece and so that was uh, it played out in this this piece where um, it was a tiny little artwork like an inch and a half by an inch and three quarters or so um, that was used it was cut up dollar pieces and I made a, a black swan and um, and then we held a, a reverse auction of sorts where the um the smallest bid um won it and so i wanted to to just bring some attention to the to the lightning network and the possibilities with it um so it was a fun interactive experience uh, collaborative where um you know, a lot of people from all over the world were, were participating and, and yeah all in all uh, I'm, I'm happy with how it went it was it was an exciting day and and uh, I had some help from the, the Blockstream guys and, and pulling it off and it was super cool. Oh, very nice. What were they like to work with? Uh, it, was, it was awesome. So um, I've been fortunate to have uh, people who are willing to, to collaborate if I 
have some sort of concepts and I maybe like throw out on Twitter, like, Hey, I'm trying to do this. Um, and so shout out to, to Grubles. Uh, I think it's not Grubles on, on Twitter. Um, I initially had reached out to, to Samson at Blockstream and then he hooked me up with, with Grubles and, and we, we ran with it from there. Oh, very nice. And, uh, how do you see, do you think Lightning is kind of the future of this, you know, this Bitcoin network? Um, I hope so. It's, it's, you know, that's the, the promise with Lightning in, in, to, in order to have these micropayments and, and deal with the, the fluctuation with the fees is, is this is the, the track that we're going. Um, so I... I think it's one of these, it's kind of like the second wave of needing to get people on board with it in order for it to work. You know, like initially it was Bitcoin and now it's, it's lightning. And I know that there's a, a bunch of brilliant people that are, that are working on it. And uh, now like for me, it's like my role is to try and, and help spread it. And so um, working on some other projects that I'm excited about that are, that are lightning related. And yeah, I think it, it has the, the, ability to help out artists and that for me is exciting like mentioned earlier the the freeing those that are under oppressive rule is sort of like the biggie yeah but being able to help out artists with uh with this technology is also huge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what are can you talk about the things you're working on with lightning or um are they surprises coming out later <laughs> <laughs> little little bit of a surprise i'll say it, it also follows in this theme of of collaboration and getting people to work together for like this common goal. Um, and so it, it is somewhat of a take on what happened with the, with the Maduro neural more so, I guess, than with uh, this, this Swan piece in that a lot of people um, were, they knew what the, the end game was and um, together they worked towards this, this goal of, of bringing down that image. So this will be different uh, in terms of kind of the end result, but, uh, yeah, the, the idea, um, since a lot of the work is just activism based is like, how, how can we reach the most people possible? Mm -hmm. oh, very cool. And so you've been doing like, uh, some fine art, some sculptures, some street art. What's, uh, what's your favorite area to focus on? Um, I think it's, it's, uh, like sort of what I just mentioned where it's, and it, it can take different forms. So I guess that the Maduro piece was street art, um, but it, it's it's really starting to solidify into this, like whatever can get people to to take action and and sort of spread this the most. Like that's for me. Like I I don't uh, I have a hard time like pontificating on what exactly is art. It's like for me of like so many different ideas that I want to get going that it, like to to sit and theorize about what actually art is, is is sort of like a like oh i'd rather be making it um so since the goal is to try and and get people interested in this and and sort of uh reverse some of the the downsides and the negativity that that mainstream media has has put into our our world um and the imagery that they use it's it's oftentimes just this, uh, you know, how, how can we get this out there and, and show that there's these other angles to it. And so really, whether it's in a, like a fine art piece or, or street art or performance art, you know, like, like the Bitcoin sign guy, like thing that he did, that for me is like <laughs> amazing, you know? So like that, like, I, I don't know if, if everyone would consider that art, but I do. Um, Wasn't and, he selling the signs at the San Francisco Bitcoin <laughs> conference <laughs> yeah 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 um so yeah just you know i i kind of like go from idea and idea and there's there's the, the common denominator is is this like okay let's let's try and get get people involved and interested um and, and how that shapes up it oftentimes takes different forms and um i i love it all i love the idea is really like my thing like i think there's other artists that are like a lot more technically skilled and, and do things in much better ways than I do in, in, in a lot of ways. But for me, like the idea is what like I'm all about. I, I love just brainstorming and, and then trying to figure out how to turn them into uh, like 
succinct messages and and uh, you know what what uh, will stick with people is is like huge for me. So like I'm fascinated by sociology and, and the psychology behind uh, movements and and things like for me like influences are um, less less so like specific artists. Like I do have some, but like 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 Edward Bernays is like the father of PR, and he's like a fascinating individual in in, in the tactics that he took to to get things to catch, you know, so uh, I'm like rambling a little bit, <laughs> but uh, yeah, my favorite is just things that uh, get people excited, get them to, to look at, at, at a subject matter in a new way. Mm -hmm. And I remember last year I saw you gluing macaroni pieces to a, <laughs> to a board um, <laughs> and that turned into the, the rat poison piece that you made can you tell us a little bit about that and what where you put it what the reaction ended up being yeah so it yeah uh, it wasn't actually macaroni it was it was rat poison oh, yeah. um but uh, <laughs> it'd be funny because maybe that was like the original art from hearkening back to when i was three or something <laughs> uh it looked like similar size and shape but uh, the reaction from many was just like, why are you doing, like, are you even able to handle that? <laughs> like, it's because it's poison. Mm -hmm. I had like checked the back of the thing. And so it was, it was safe to handle and do research there. Um, but going back to what I was referencing earlier with trying to right some of the, the wrongs that MSM has done in our space, you know, it's this, this thing where, there's no marketing or, or PR team for Bitcoin. And I, I'm a big uh, underdog guy and I, I don't like abuses of power. And so um, th the times that I do sort of like push back at people online, it's, it's because I think that they're like abusing their, their power in certain ways. And so Buffett, who's like, Berkshire they're, they're just like heavily invested in banks you know you don't at first get the whole story and then when you dig in a little bit deeper you say okay well here's why he probably doesn't want bitcoin to succeed so um yeah that sort of inspired that that piece and i was going to be heading to uh this big conference anyway in new york and there was like a berkshire office there and i figured that might be a good place to put it so it was uh, a piece made out of rat Rat poison, it was like a, a skull and crossbones that went up on their offices. And uh, people in general, I think, in our little uh, online Twitter uh, atmosphere, they he put out a tweet or he said something. Buffett said Bitcoin was like rat poison. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so that was the, the basis for it. Um, and yeah, so. He's still, I, I, I sort of wish that this, this lunch meeting did pan out. What was it supposed yeah. to be yesterday? Yeah, um, I don't know what's going on with that. He is, uh, the Tron guy, he's either stuck in China or so, something weird's happening with it where he can't seem to make it for lunch, but. Yeah, I don't, I think uh, Buffett just really loves money. I, it wouldn't have surprised me if he didn't like look up from his, mcdonald's or whatever he normally eats um but i just uh i i'd like for him to hear something from from other people you know and at least have like a captive audience to to discuss things i don't know who would necessarily be the right person for that but um anyway yeah so going back to what we were, <laughs> we were talking about it was well received by by some other people i had one guy actually at that at the Bitcoin Magazine conference, he was just like, you should not be doing, doing that. Like there's, like what if a kid got a hold of it? Like that was not, like what are you doing? And I was like, oh, well it was high up enough to where a kid probably wouldn't have got it. But I don't know, I guess having worked as controversial. Right now, kid got her from it. <laughs> yeah. Um, all different ty types of uh, responses to it, which I guess, you kind of want it. You don't, you don't want no response as an artist. You want something. Yeah. So Something's what happened? All the employees go to work that morning and they saw the big sign, you know, made of rat poison or, and then they, yeah, so, like, what's this from? And then look into it. And yeah. And then there was a QR code that linked to uh, all the different bank investments um, from Berkshire. 
Oh, but, that's cool. <laughs> but I didn't hang around long enough to see any sort of reactions. There was like, there was a huge police presence, like literally right around the corner. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, I like, and I didn't plan well for it. I was like wearing red shoes. So uh, yeah, I didn't stick around long. Yeah, probably a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And um, what are your thoughts on Libra? Um, I think it's like a double-edged sword. I, I like Melton's commentary and it's just not a cryptocurrency, you know? Um, and I'm not like, I, I like that it's putting crypto in, in the public's mind. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't think we would have, the U S treasury secretary talking about it in a negative light had Libra not come up so quickly. Uh, so it's sort of this, uh, dual reaction that we're getting, mm -hmm. um, Libra specifically, you know, I, it's, 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 it's not open. And so their, their promise is that down the road, they're going to work towards it being more decentralized. It's like, how are we supposed to, at least I don't really trust, Facebook to do that based on like past performance. And so, you know, it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's good and bad. It's, we're getting, um, it was interesting seeing Bitcoin sort of <laughs> uh, being talked about in, in a positive light in comparison, you know, in Congress. Um, yeah. but I don't know. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah. Kind of same thing. I think, I don't like that they told them they had the moratorium. Like they, I feel like that's an, you know, they're, they're still a company and they still have rights that they can operate. They haven't put this thing out yet. They haven't broken any laws. Like it's still very much in an idea stage. So I thought that was a little bit of an over step. Um, but, but it was, yeah, I thought it was uh, good. I thought of even having the, uh, the U S treasury secretary talking about it was that they, even at that stage, they could have shut Bitcoin down a long time, not actually shut it down, but they could have said it's illegal or that no banks can interact with, uh, you know, an on or off ramp and they haven't. And I thought, you know, out of his message, even though we have Trump, you know, they're tweeting about it and stuff, they're still not saying, they're still saying as long as you're doing it with KYC and within the overall banking system that it's, uh, it's okay, which I know a lot of, you know, that's not what Bitcoin was created for, but I think it's still, you know, there's, there's no talk of, oh, we're just going to shut this down, um, which I guess is maybe a good thing. Um, but yeah, the Libra stuff, it seems, I think it could, you know, create like at the worst case scenario, a really, um, a really scary spot where if everyone's money is is tied into their social capital we could come to a place like how it is in China right now like if uh, someone say is behind on certain like their car payment and they're an uber driver then you know maybe their uber account locks them out so they can't operate the, in their job for you know or who knows but it just gives it gives a lot of centralized control to um, to these entities trying to do it and it's kind of the opposite of, of financial freedom or privacy that that I think is integral to Bitcoin so um, but at the same time it might lead more people to Bitcoin once they learn about this the next step is obviously to learn about Bitcoin um, and then they might be attracted to it so we'll see but it's, yeah. But right now it's nothing. Like it's one white paper. How many white yeah, papers have sure. seen over the years that don't result in anything? So until there's something actually concrete happening, you know, more so, I think it's it's too early to tell really what it's going to look like. Yeah, yeah. I think the the swiftness uh, of the response was telling. You know, there uh, there's there's a lot of people that are really high up that are that are pretty frightened about what could potentially happen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah all over the world too it's not just here you know it's yeah. right eating right the day that it was released and it was uh yeah and this duality this this uh it's so fascinating that this global nature of it in any particular country risking falling behind by not embracing uh bitcoin is just like amazing to me because it it really puts things in check you know it, it uh because if ultimately this is the direction that we're heading and you decide to regulate the hell out of it, then 
then uh, obviously that's not a good thing. No, it can lead to that, like, uh, you know, that one world currency talk that some of the, um, you know, Illuminati or like the, the conspiracy theories have talked about for years of us moving to this one world currency where every transaction is monitored. Sometimes I worry that's what the path we're taking with this Bitcoin stuff when, when you know, we want to be on this completely opposite path. But I think the things like Lightning Network and there's a lot of work being done on the privacy side and the fact that FinCEN came out and said non-custodial, uh, you know, solutions are not going to be counted towards the all the KYC and stuff that's required of money service businesses. If you're holding your own coins, you're not in that system. So I think that'll create a lot of people, like anyone that's starting development on anything is probably just the regulatory hurdles to be in that system is, is so large that there's a really big incentive to make it a non-custodial um, product, whatever it is. Yeah. So. Um, I guess, you know, we're at a crossroads, but right. uh, never a dull moment. Exactly. And then one last question. So you had uh, Dorian with you at that conference, the Bitcoin magazine conference. Um, how did you meet him? And like, what can you give us a little bit of background on his story for anyone that might not um, remember from was it 2014 that he kind of that he got what was it he got arrested um they thought he was satoshi nakamoto and or uh, maybe i need to learn about it too for the full well, yeah. um <laughs> so yeah march 2014 was when newsweek when looking for some sort of splashy headline to to promote their going back to print uh edition um fingered him as being the creator of bitcoin and so they included images of, of his house and his, and his address and his license plate. And uh, he wasn't arrested, but he had just like a media frenzy that descended upon him and just totally shook up as an entire world. Um, <clears throat> and so, like it or not, he was in the public's eye and um, obviously like a pretty, pretty stressful situation. Yeah. And so I wanted, I, just in reviewing what was going on, um, I mentioned one of the startups um, that, I, that I was working on and doing sales at. Well, it was, it was legal related. So in a past life, I talked to attorneys uh, often and I, I knew enough to know that the guy that was trying to help him out probably wasn't going to be the one to, to see this thing through. Um, it was like a solo young attorney going up against Newsweek was like uh. Uh, so I wanted to, to just kind of look into this more because like here he was already getting uh, messed with and then I don't think a, a good like a, a, a legal case that wasn't going to work out well on top of that would be good so I uh, just reached out and then offered to help out with a with a, an artwork where uh, the proceeds would go to him and so that's how I met him and um, yeah, we've we've been friends since. So he's come to different holiday stuff, and he's just a great great guy. Um, and he has this. Um, he doesn't want to be obviously in the in the public eye for the wrong reasons, but in the the few conferences that we've gone to together, he's he's enjoyed it and talking to people. I think this last one was maybe a little bit overwhelming on on day two because everyone you know wanting the photos and whatnot, but. But he does uh, like it to, to some degree, and um, I know he had a good time at the conference. And um, yeah, so I we decided to do prints um, of the work that I did way back in in 2014, and so that was sort of this uh, uh, the reason that we were in attendance together was was to to have fun at the conference and sort of promote these prints that we were doing. Nice. And what was there any? What information did Newsweek use to, to say that he was Satoshi Nakamoto? Part of it was proximity to Hal Finney. Um, also, that his, his middle name was Satoshi. There wasn't like a lot to go from. And if you go and reread it, it's like there was some pretty far reaching statements that um, you know, are pretty easily disproven, but they haven't retracted their statements at all too. So it's pretty, unprofessional in my opinion uh, that here we are you know several years on and um 
Yeah, so it was pretty, pretty awful what they did to him, and that's why I initially wanted to reach out. And I'm glad that I did because, um, like I said, Dorian's a super cool guy, and yeah. he's got to meet some interesting people in the space too and, and uh, make, make new friends through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you guys looked, at, you were sit. you know, I, saw, I watched you guys uh, standing near, near the prince with him and it was constant people coming up for photos with him like every two minutes, but he, he made everyone's day, I think, by, you know, everyone was so excited to see him. And, yeah, I think a lot of people wish it was, was him, you know, if, if there was a public face to Bitcoin. Um, he would be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, so what do, you, what do you have on the agenda for the next few months? Anything exciting? Or? Yeah, um, I'm working on several different pieces simultaneously. Uh, I just moved, and so that took some time away from, from the studio. Um, but now I've got a bunch of things going on where they're at different stages. One of them relates to uh, like seed phrases. And so I want to do something that is kind of interesting with integrating uh, seed phrases into the work itself. Um, and then uh, the work earlier I referenced that involves collaboration and the Lightning Network, that's slowly coming along. And yeah, a couple other random ones too. So it's um, just a wide range of different pieces that are different mediums. and. For, for better and worse, it keep, definitely keeps it interesting that the learning curve on, on the different stuff is, is greater. Um, but I love it. I feel really blessed to be able to do what I'm doing. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just an amazing space. I, I'm so glad that, that I found, found Bitcoin. And um, yeah, I'm just going to keep on keeping on doing the art stuff. Very cool. Well, I look forward to seeing what, what you make next. And, uh, and where can people find you? Uh, so it's kind of difficult to spell. It's, it's uh, crypto and graffiti, all one word, uh, at .com. So crypto, C-R-Y-P-T-O-G-R-A-F-F-I-T-I. Uh, and on the socials too. So more active on Twitter than, than Instagram. Uh, yeah, crypto graffiti on all of them. All right, I'll put the links in there as well. But I, I bought one of your t-shirts last night, the, the Shaw 256 one. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you for that. I to wear for this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm, yeah, anyway. The really, lots of really nice stuff on there on your t-shirts and um, all the different art pieces too. So yeah, I didn't realize how many different, like pretty much every major crypto company has one of your sculptures, it looks like, in their office, in their like, <laughs> areas like that so that's pretty awesome uh yeah been lucky to to work with some awesome companies in the space and you know because the space is doing well they'll move into new offices and expand and there's a lot of a lot of blank walls so it's yeah. I've been fortunate in that way very cool well thank you so much and have a great weekend thanks a lot Sasha all right thanks bye yep.